Great, so thanks everyone for coming. As Marcel said, this is a presentation about the impact of the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Um, so, in addition to being a great pun, what does it mean to unroll the impacts of TARP? Um, so, there are two levels of this analysis. The first question is that once we've identified that there are two groups of banks that exist, that is, banks that participated in the TARP program and banks that didn't, what are the sort of categorical differences between banks that fall into each category? Um, and then the second question is, when do those impacts and differences arise? Do they arise at the very beginning of the sample, before TARP is a blip on anyone's radar? Do they persist throughout the sample, or do they arise after the TARP program, and therefore could they foreseeably be the result of that program? Um, so my talk has a number of parts. First, I'm going to go through the background to so explain sort of what it is I'm talking about when I say the TARP program. I'm going to talk about some of the existing literature on this question, since it's incredibly well studied in the profession of economics, um, preview some of the results that I come to at the end of my analysis, and then discuss the sources that I use for data um, and the methodology I applied to it. So for the sake of this talk, I applied a three-tiered approach um, to exploring what these differences would be. So the first thing that I looked at was the relative balance sheet or composition between TARP and non-TARP banks. So do they generally tend to allocate resources on balance sheet, that is like where they allocate loans and liabilities, differently across the sample? Then I look at the relative risk ratings of the assets and liabilities on those balance sheets. Um, finally, I explore some regulatory measures that might be indicative of the relative health of TARP and non-TARP banks during the sample. Um, and then I go into some opportunities for future study of this question, since despite the sort of wide array of literature that exists, there's plenty more to explore, and conclude with some recommendations about policy related to financial crises. So first, the background. So the Troubled Asset Relief Program encapsulates a number of policies, beginning with the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act during the Bush presidency, persisting through Obama's term. Um, but I'm specifically talking about the CPP, or the Capital Purchase Program, which was a program by the federal government to essentially purchase preferred stock in banks that were seen as failing and undercapitalized during the crisis. So about 700 banks took part, including the nine largest bank holding companies, which were required by the Treasury to take part in the program. Um, and so the policy objectives, of, as stated by the Treasury, were twofold. Basically, they wanted to stabilize a reeling economic system, and then to be able to sort of create more activity in the economy to stabilize the economy through lending. So by recapitalizing banks, presumably banks could take that capital and inject it back into the economy, thereby having a stabilization effect. Um, so my primary motivation is basically that I re wanted to read a lot about this topic and I found that quite a bit of the literature on this question was incredibly mixed. So I could find studies that said that TARP banks tended to lend more during this period, even though a lot of the literature tends towards that they lent less. Um, that TARP banks generally were more risky, but there were plenty of banks that, or plenty of studies that indicated that TARP banks had less systemic risk on balance sheet. Um, and finally, that even a question that's literally just a factual claim, so were TARP banks more or less well capitalized, the literature is mixed on that question. Um, so my hope was that with this study, I could take some novel approaches to parsing this data, and also the vast majority of studies that I read came out sort of in the wake of this policy when it was still a hot topic for economic policy. So this is looking at like 2010 to 2012 period. My hope is that with data that encapsulates all the way through 2017, there's just more information to parse through, maybe more conclusive findings can be found. Um, so there are documented differences between the balance sheets of TARP and non-TARP banks. I found that TARP banks generally lent more as a percent of total assets, so they fulfilled that part of the objective of the TARP program, um, but then in terms of stabilizing the financial system, they actually took on more systemic risk on balance sheet, specifically in that increased lending. So looking at the relative risk ratings of the loans that both types of banks had, TARP banks were generally riskier. But when you uh, control for a fixed difference that exists between the two categories of banks, I find that it's not significant year over year the changes to that difference. So there is some fixed difference that exists, but it doesn't arise at a particular point in the sample, which suggests that the kinds of policies that I'm studying may not have actually been the result of that effect, but rather that there are just two types of banks in the economy, those that were undercapitalized and had to participate in the TARP program, and for whatever reason had a different business strategy. Um, so the data that I employ is quarterly coal reports 
submitted by banks where basically they report on consolidated balance sheet information. So the balance sheet includes assets, liabilities, and then certain off balance sheet items um, that exist within their portfolio. I look at the sample from 2001 to 2017 um, basically because reporting norms are such that they report the same categories, anything prior to that, and it's a huge toss up as to what kind of information I'm going to have available. Um, so the consolidated balance sheet, it's what's called the HC form, and there are a number of forms within that that I looked at. So first, um, looked at total loans and leases, so that would be the HCC, some of the losses as per those loans so that I could assess the riskiness of them, and what I think is the most important, the HCR, which is where banks report the, rel like the relative categorization as per the risk rating category of everything that they hold on balance sheet and some regulatory measures. Um, so my sample dealt with a number of banks, basically by virtue of the fact that only 700 banks in the financial system participated in the capital purchase program. As expected, there are significantly more non-TARP banks in my sample. Um, so I took the liberty of dividing the data based on the FDIC's categorization of banks by asset size, and so any bank with assets numbering less than 1 billion were designated small, 1 billion to 50 billion would be in the medium category, and then anything greater than 50 billion was a large bank. So uh, as a, like, in terms of the general spectrum of banks that existed in the United States, the vast majority would be small as per this rating, there's still quite a few medium banks, and then large banks make up a much smaller part of the sample, but there are some interesting idiosyncrasies that exist for large banks. They sort of exist as a different beast than the small and medium-sized banks in terms of what kind of activities they pursue during this period. Um, and so this yields still 90,000 observations. It's a fairly robust <coughs> data set. So the first thing that I look at is the relative balance sheet composures between TARP and non-TARP banks. Um, so just to go through some summary statistics, um, I promised to bring this back up at the end in the Q&A, but just for ease of going through things quickly, um, get a sort of a quick take on what those figures look like. So the vast majority of balance sheet in, on the asset side is in lending, on the deposit side is in, uh, or on the liability side rather is in deposits. Um, and then looking at sort of a more granular breakdown among small, medium, and large banks, you can see that a lot of these allocations persist across banks in the sample. Um, on the liability side, the same would be true. So especially take a look at those trading numbers because they're incredibly small, won't be a focus of this talk. Um, so what were the takeaways from the numbers that I just flashed on the screen at you? So first is that most of the balance sheet is devoted to loans and deposits on the liability side. So quite a bit of my talk is going to deal with those loans numbers because I think that those are the largest source of risk for the banks that I'm studying. Um, large banks generally tend to have my, more diversity in terms of the business pursuits that they exhibit. So they have much larger repo and trading businesses relative to medium and small banks um, where those are much less significant and largely negligible. Um, and finally, that there are market differences between TARP and non-TARP banks just looking at the raw numbers. Um, so I decided to plot what those numbers look like, so this is just the raw number of loans and leases as a share of total assets. And so observing this, you can see that throughout the sample, TARP banks generally exhibit a higher number, but it generally tends to converge around, or converge for the median um, in recent years. Uh, but this is just the raw numbers, it's not necessarily a statistically significant finding, so I wanted to get more into the weeds of what that looked like. Um, the next thing that's significant is just that this is true, especially for small and medium banks, and then large banks, like, broadly, the difference between TARP and non-TARP banks in terms of uh, TARP banks having a greater share of loans and leases relative to total assets is consistent, but they also do a lot of funky things in terms of the movements of those numbers. I'm interested in that. Um, so what, basically what model did I apply to studying this question? So this is the baseline model that I applied to every level of analysis, which essentially starts with some sort of variable of interest. So that would be loans or cash or trading or repo as a share of total assets, or the uh, items in the other categories, a share of total liabilities, then an indicator variable that indicated whether or not a bank participated in the TARP program at any point in the, during the existence of that program, a year dummy for every year in the sample, and then an interaction term between the year dummy and the TARP participant. So I did one, uh, one set of regressions where I included this indicator for TARP participation meant to capture a sort of fixed effect of the difference between TARP and non-TARP banks. Um, then I re-ran the regression omitting that variable to capture year over year what was the effect of TARP participation. Um, so these are the coefficients when included when uh, the baseline TARP effect is included for banks for the share of loans as a percent of total assets for all banks included in the sample. So observing from this, basically that top variable indicates that the lending is a larger share for TARP banks consistently. Um, but there's a very wide confidence interval in all of these interaction terms. Um, furthermore, the effect of TARP seems to diminish or move closer to the zero line um, post-crisis, 
But there are a number of uh, effects in terms of total lending patterns that would be expected from this result year over year. So lending tends to increase during the boom pre-crisis from 2003 to 2009. Um, after the crisis, lending contracts among all banks, which would be expected given the sort of fear of banks at that point of taking out more risk. Um, and finally, now that we're in a boom again, uh, lending is generally tending to increase, and that's true for both TARP and non-TARP banks. So just to get a better idea of what the data, the difference looks like when you exclude this fixed term, it seems to be around 1.5, or one, rather, two to three and a half percent difference between TARP and non-TARP banks. That is, that TARP banks lend more for every year in the sample, and that that effect is about three percent total more of their assets being devoted to lending. Um, but the year dummies are obviously identical. So the baseline starts at around 64% for the average non-TARP bank in 2001. Um, the TARP effect can be considered about a 3% increase. Um, the yearly changes are then not statistically significant. And then, as I said before, if you take out that fixed difference, there becomes a change of between 2 to 3.5%. Um, and in, in the quantile regressions that I applied to the question, um, the 25th percentile had the greatest effect of TARP and the 75th percentile had the least. So what you can take away from that is essentially that for the banks that were lending less as a share of their total assets, the TARP banks that lent less lent relatively less less, so a greater amount relative to non-TARP banks. So the worst offenders in terms of the contraction of loans weren't as bad for TARP banks as they were for non-TARP banks, but the TARP effect is less significant as banks tend to lend more, so the 75th percentile. Um, so the next set of analyses dealt with the risk ratings of the loans that banks were making during this period. Um, so banks were, are required to report in terms of four categories of risk ratings, 0 and 20 being less risky, and then for the sake of this analysis, um, anything 50% or greater would be considered to be a risky item to have on balance sheet. So this should all be familiar from a few slides back. Um, I applied the same regression model, but incl or included different variables of interest. So that Y term, now it was the percent of assets in the 50% and 100% or just 100% category as a percentage of the, either the total loans, just looking at loans, or total assets when looking at assets across balance sheet and every other variable is consistent. Um, so the loan allocation by risk category, it looks from this graph like both TARP and non-TARP banks have the vast majority of their loans in this 100% category and a lot, quite a few in the greater than 50% category. So that's sort of the bulk of analysis, but if there are idiosyncratic differences, that is that uh, TARP banks generally tend to exist more in this risky category, that would be an important variable in terms of increasing systemic risk in the economy. Um, so looking at the percent of loans with 50% risk rate rating, these are just some analyses that basically suggest the main question. What's going on with large banks? So why is it that large banks have, ver or have graphs that look so different from the other banks in the sample? So the results indicate to me that these are just very, very noisy. That is, that in the greater than 50% category, they're uh, statistically insignificant and negative effect. In the 100% category, it's statistically insignificant and positive. So both are statistically insignificant results that go in opposite directions. Obviously, there's further study to be done here, but it looks like the differences between TARP and non-TARP banks during the study can't be determined to be significant and are prob probably can be omitted from the data. That being said, given that the vast majority of banks in the sample are in this medium small category, it makes sense that those results aren't really being captured by what's being studied. Um, so the next variables to look at are just the 100% risk rating of loans across all banks. So is there some sort of effect to be observed? These graphs look a lot like the percentage of lending as a share of total assets, where the result was that basically TARP banks generally take on both lend more and take on more risk. So regardless of what sort of cross-section of risk analyses that I'm looking at, the TARP bank term is always both statistically significant and positive, which indicates that TARP banks are overall riskier than non-TARP banks, both in terms of their assets, their loans, and then all items on balance sheet. Um, and then when the fixed term is omitted, the terms for 2015 and 2017 are larger than any year other year in the sample, which indicates that there's actually a greater difference emerging between TARP and non-TARP banks, even in the or a significant number of years post-TARP, which suggests to me that this may not be the result of TARP as a policy necessarily, but some other fixed difference that deals with the sort of categorical differences that led these banks to be in different categories in the first place. So these are the same graphs again now with 50% risk rating of um, all 
items on balance sheet with 100% risk rating, the results are largely consistent. Um, so according to every, basically every way of looking at this problem, TARP banks take on more risk overall. So the last thing that I wanted to look at was the regulatory measurements of bank health. That is, are TARP banks generally healthier than non-TARP banks? Are non-TARP banks have generally healthier than TARP banks um, during this period? So luckily, the uh, Fed provides a really great measurement of this in terms of the CAMELS rating system. So these are private and proprietary ratings that happen internally of all bank holding companies to determine the relative health of those bank holding companies. Um, that assess them across a variety of these terms. Uh, these results aren't issued publicly, but because there are a number of existing measurements that are fairly well um, established to be correlated with these measures, you can get a pretty good idea of what these figures might look like. So for the sake of this talk, I can't go into all of the CAMELS measurements but I just wanted to talk about the first one, which is the question of capital adequacy, or how well capitalized banks were during this period, given that the stated objective of the TARP program was to capitalize the bank. So this is a question of tier one capital as a percent of total risk-weighted risk assets. Um, and so what the effect seems to be is that TARP banks generally have a negative TARP bank term, which indicates that TARP banks are less well capitalized during this period. Um, and so, for, or I guess for the sake of these results, again, the same pattern emerged where there's some sort of fixed difference between TARP and non-TARP banks, but quite a few of these coefficients aren't statistically significant. So this is important when considering the effect of the purpose of TARP, basically that the TARP effect is insignificant in the years immediately post-crisis, that there's not really a documented difference between TARP and non-TARP banks during this period. Um, otherwise, being a TARP bank tends to have a negative effect. So what's important for this is that First, that if the, TARP bank, if the TARP program is about taking banks that are otherwise undercapitalized and capitalizing them, then presumably in the years post-TARP program, if banks then equalize out how capitalized they were, that would probably be a fulfillment of that particular objective of the TARP program, that banks, were, that, banks that were previously undercapitalized were then catching up to the other banks in the sample. Finally, the positive coefficient on large banks indicates that for the most systemically important financial institutions, TARP program was probably largely successful. So the takeaway from this, I know I threw a lot of information at you, is that basically TARP banks both lend more and take on more risks. So returning to the sort of two stated objectives of the TARP program, it may be, or it may be found that it doesn't stabilize the financial system because there's more risk, but it certainly stimulates lending, which was the other objective. Um, the distinctions would manifest differently between banks of different sizes and within each quartile measurement. So there's sort of more parsing to do in these more granular measures that haven't previously been applied to the literature. Um, and then the differences between TARP and non-TARP banks don't, for the most part, appear to change over time. There's some sort of fixed difference, and it persists. Um, and so the questions for future research would be a more robust counterfactual as to what would have happened to banks that participated in TARP had they not participated, um, and then more granular lending data to indicate if TARP banks are lending more, what are they lending to? Is that broadly good for the economy? And so once these results have happened, um, you can make better policy recommendations as to whether or not bailout policy should be pursued in the future because it will indicate basically whether it's worth taking on more risk, what are the fixed differences between the banks that need to participate in this program and don't, and how might this program stave off sort of the differences between those banks or bring them closer together such that you wouldn't need to pursue this kind of policy in the future. Cool. Mm -hmm. recapitalized banks and then didn't include a very robust regulatory regime to go along with it. Um, so presumably, I think, even if banks are able to increase lending, they don't necessarily have to seek out riskier sources for that, especially if across the economy um, lending is contracting during that period. So presumably there are more avenues available to lend that aren't being pursued that aren't quite as risky. So I think just being able to parse through basically where banks are allocating that capital, they could increase lending and not necessarily go to riskier sources, but it's just a question of how well regulated they are, how much risk we're comfortable letting them take on during that period. <laughs> 
Um, so we have measurements of risk, but then there's no corresponding mandate that you have to be under a certain uh, amount of that risk. Does that follow, follow on? I mean, I, I, well, two things I want to ask. One was, I think the top X banks were forced to take yes. part. Wells Fargo said, you know, if we were forced to take it, we didn't need it. <coughs> so does that affect your uh, regressions at all by not, you know, maybe doing them with large banks excluding the top X banks? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to break them out by size. So the yeah, top. But there were, there were some in, the, in your large banks that were not mm -hmm. mandated to do that. Anymore. Right, it was just the large, nine largest banks okay, that were mandated. But uh, following on this question, it seems to me that people would argue, hey, this, this is exactly what you would expect, more loans and more risky. Because basically, you have a, you know if you take more risk, TARP says, hey, we'll bail you out. Yes. Is that kind of what you feel like, so this is exactly what, you, what people predicted was, we're going to get more lending, but we're also going to get more risk because the future harm to your profits is not as great, expected to be as great. Right. So the moral hazard question comes up quite a bit. Um, and I think that, again, the answer is probably more regulation. So it can't be carte blanche to make those decisions for yourself because totally unregulated, um, the determination would probably be that they can get away with that and they will be bailed out. Um, but it also... I guess the, the corollary to that is that it doesn't look like all banks across the sample took on more risk, um, and that if that result were true, then presumably they would be taking on a lot more risk after the TARP program and after that bailout takes place, given that before that no one really knew whether or not they would be bailed out. Um, so I guess based on my findings, I wouldn't think that would be the expectation, but that isn't really what the data suggested, rather that there were sort of categorical differences between the two types of banks that persisted over time, but they didn't emerge after one group was bailed out. To what extent do you consider demand considerations in the, in the reduction in lending <laughs> and prices? And if one thinks back to that period, um, it seemed that Mortgage borrowing fell pretty sharply. Uh, of course, a lot of banks didn't want to be in the mortgage game anymore. But I mean, a lot of people couldn't afford to borrow anymore. They couldn't buy houses. Um, firms actually enjoyed fairly handsome profits and sat on the money and invested. And the Fed brought the interest rate pretty much down to zero. So, you know, was it the case that these banks that were comparatively well capitalized um, would have been happy to lend if someone had wanted to borrow. And that what you may be picking up is that other people who were desperate um, actually did try to borrow in that period. And they finished up with these banks that were also some in some distress because the better capitalized banks simply didn't want to take the risk given that they'd fought so hard to rebuild capital and they didn't want to take the risk of erosion. I mean, I think that's certainly a possibility. I guess in that case, I would probably expect that I would probably expect to see that once banks that were able to be recapitalized by the government and sort of had that option available to them that was much less risky, then you would see a corresponding reduction in the lending that I didn't observe. Did, did you get a sense? Who, who? I mean, you mentioned this as an area for further research, but who was borrowing? I mean, who actually were going to the banks to? to try and get significant amounts of money from banks at that time. There was a, so there, there was a precipitous drop in mortgage lending. Um, and a lot of, I, I think commercial and industrial lending increased during that period. And I'm not sure which other categories. Yeah, trade financing went down fairly sharply. And that, you know, people worried that was one of the reasons for the recession that, that actually, they said no protectionism, we're going to continue to trade, but then they did become protectionist, and at the same time, lots of banks would extend short-term funding because of the, the risk reward was, was pretty bad. And then, of course, the, for a period, the interbank market stopped functioning because you didn't know who was shaky, and you weren't going to lend them zero percent overnight when you didn't know the money would come back the next day. So you did get sort of a bit of a breakdown in the normal way that the, the interbank market functioned. But as I said, I, I don't have a good feel for whether or not you know, the, the potentially large amounts that would have been lent by the, by the non-TARP major banks, whether or not um, their clients that normally would have been major corporations were either unwilling to borrow because they looked at the demand prospects if they did invest and said, well, the market's not going to be there, we're not going to invest now. 
um, on the one hand, or um, that's probably it actually. There was no real demand for investment, so they didn't buy. But it's unclear to me what was what was really going on with the big the big buy. I mean, the other result that might be significant is that uh, for both categories of banks, the, as we are talking about, the repo business goes way down on both sides. So there's much less of an interbank market, um, and that's persisted over time, so it hasn't really recovered since that period. Um, but the corresponding offset is that uh, non-TARP banks generally tend to have much more of their assets in cash and balances as a result. So as every other business sort of declines on the cliff, um, the offset is that TARP banks are lending more and other banks are just holding on to that cash. Any other questions? Thank you.